brothers and sisters. It's the Sunday after Easter, and the grave could not hold Jesus, and that pulpit cannot hold me. Uh, we're going to have fun today. Before we get started, I want to say a word of thanks um, uh, to the choir, the musicians, and our music staff. They did a tremendous job the last two weeks, didn't they? They did a tremendous job. so appreciate them. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John. I'll be reading from John chapter 20, uh, beginning with verse 19 and reading down through verse 29. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to follow along with me, and if you don't, you're welcome to listen as we read uh, from the Gospel of John chapter 20, again beginning with verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As Jesus spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy as they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me so am I sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. The disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it. Unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, just as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer, but believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told them, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me this morning? Gracious God, we are so thankful to gather once again to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, for the way that your Holy Spirit has moved through our gathering thus far. And we pray, Lord, that your Spirit would continue to move among us. Lord, I pray that in the next few minutes that I might decrease in this place in order that Jesus Christ might increase. And I pray, Lord, that my words would be your words. And God, as always, we humbly ask that you would open our ears, open our minds. Most of all, dear God, open our hearts so that the words that you have for us today might be more for us than simply more information. But Lord, we pray that today your words might dig deeply within our hearts that your words might transform us. And as always, we offer this prayer in the name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray together, saying, Amen. <coughs> Way back in the 1920s and 30s, there was a guy named Robert Ripley who was a cartoonist he was an entrepreneur and he was an amateur explorer and he started this little newspaper column, this little cartoon that he called Ripley's Believe It or Not. If we can have the first slide, Ripley's Believe It or Not. And for years this ran in, in newspapers all over the country and soon around the world. 
And Ripley expanded the Ripley's Believe It or Not empire into radio and then into television and film. And finally, he had museums all over the world that, that had some of the artifacts that he found. And, and at the heyday of Ripley's Believe It or Not, the researchers that worked for Robert Ripley would stay in the library sometimes 10, 11 hours a day doing research to find interesting things different things. And of course the tagline was, believe it or not. Now some of you may have, if you've been to Gatlinburg, you've been to the Ripley Believe It or Not Museum. I, I went when I was younger uh, and I pestered my dad to get in there and I was very disappointed that most of the things were made out of wax. <laughs> I thought we were really going to see some, some interesting things in the Ripley's Museum, but they were, they were reproductions. But Ripley died in 1949 and left behind a great empire that still goes on today, believe it or not. And when I think about Robert Ripley, it makes me think about poor Thomas the disciple. Poor old Thomas. How tough it must be to have gone through his life only to be known forever as Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. You know, it's really not fair for us to even use that term because I don't see Thomas as a doubter. I see Thomas as, as somebody who wanted what the rest of the disciples wanted. They, they wanted to see the risen Jesus Christ. Thomas appears two other times in the Gospel of John. Uh, the first time is in John chapter 11, if we can have the next slide, please. Uh, Jesus and the disciples are about to go uh, to Bethany because Lazarus has died. And they know it's dangerous. And Thomas, who is called Didymus, which means the twin, uh, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we might die with him. This gives us an insight into Thomas's character. Thomas was not somebody who was fearful. He was not somebody who was afraid. Indeed, when Jesus was talking about going to Jerusalem, Peter said, God forbid, we're not going to let you go there. Thomas said, let's go so that we may die with him. So we get this image of Thomas as a, as a brave person. The next time that Thomas appears is in John chapter 14. We have the next slide. Uh, and he asked Jesus the famous question because uh, Jesus is telling the disciples, hey, you, you know where I'm going. All you have to do is follow me. And Thomas said, wait a minute. We don't know where you're going. What are you talking about? How do we know the way? And what we get from this scripture is we get, a, we get an inkling that, that Thomas was somebody who things had to make sense to. And he wasn't afraid to ask a question. He was absolutely not afraid to ask a question. And of course, Jesus' answer was, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am life, Jesus said. But Thomas is, is not a fearful person. Uh, we, we get this idea that Thomas has is, is, is got some bravery. In, and, and Thomas is a person like many of us are. He just wants to understand. He just wants to understand. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How in the world do we know the way? Now, the first person to see Jesus in the Gospel of John after he'd risen from the dead was Mary Magdalene, who immediately runs to the disciples and says, I've seen the Lord. And the disciples look at her and go, okay, that's good for you. And then they lock themselves up in a room because they're afraid. While they're locked up in this room, who shows up behind the locked doors, apparently in the resurrected body, able to get past a locked door? Jesus shows up, says, peace be with you, shows them his hands, and says, brothers, I, I want you to believe. I want you to believe. So, ten of the eleven disciples see Jesus in the flesh. Now, now, I want you to note this. They didn't believe what Mary Magdalene said until they saw it with their own eyes. Okay? 
But then the story picks up, and they see Thomas, and what do they say to Thomas? They say, we have seen the Lord. And what does Thomas say? Yeah, you, you saw Jesus. Yeah, I believe that. And they're like, no, really, we saw Jesus. We've seen the Lord. <laughs> and Thomas says, mm -mm. I need to see the nail holes. I need to stick my hand in his side. I need to know. I need to know. And it fascinates me that this idea we've got is, is that Thomas is, is somehow doubting when all Thomas wanted was what the rest of the disciples got. Now, can you imagine, in the scripture I read you, eight days later, the disciples are still locked up in this room. <laughs> so it still hasn't really gotten through to them that, that Jesus is alive and that things are different and they don't need to be afraid. But they're locked up together. Jesus shows up, says, peace be with you, looks directly at Thomas and says, put your fingers here, put your hand here. And it's interesting. There is a Greek word for doubt, but it's not used in this passage, in the Greek version. Jesus says, don't be faithless any longer, but instead believe. And it's fascinating to me that Thomas doesn't walk up to Jesus and go, I know exactly how big the nails were. Let me see. Does that look like a spear to me? Maybe. Maybe it was not. You know, he's not doing the CSI thing. When he sees Jesus, he says something startling. He says, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. You see, he recognizes that the resurrected Jesus is indeed the Messiah. He is indeed God's Son. He is indeed everything that Jesus said he was. And then Jesus says to Thomas and the rest of the disciples, Blessed are you because you've seen, but even more blessed are those that have not seen, yet they believe. Now sometimes we read this and we think, well, Jesus must have been saying to Thomas, you should have believed. You should have believed. But this wasn't a rebuke of Thomas that Jesus is doing here. What I believe is happening here is that Jesus is saying... There are going to be people who are going to come along much later in history and they're not going to have seen me and they're going to believe and they're going to be blessed. That was really a blessing for all of us, for all of us. So brothers and sisters, I just don't think that doubt is the problem here. I, I think that, that poor Thomas, we... we can use that phrase doubting Thomas, but we should know that what Thomas wanted was what all, all of us want. Thomas wanted to know. He wanted to know if Jesus was really alive. And that's what we want to know too. Now, I have encountered people in my life and in my ministry who have said, I've never had one doubt. I, I accepted Jesus Christ when I was going through confirmation class, when I was a young adult, when I was a teenager, and I've never once ever, ever doubted. And I just always go, really? Really? Because brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong with doubt. It is indeed our doubts, our questions, our struggles. This is what brings us closer to faith. It's wrestling with our doubts. It's wrestling with who Jesus is. It's wrestling when things get tough. It's trying to figure things out. That's how we know. And each and every time that I have been doubtful or I have not believed it's always been working things out, thinking things through. It's always been working through that. And the 
most fascinating thing happens. My faith always becomes stronger because of that. Because of that. You see, sometimes what we want to say to people is you shouldn't have any doubts. I, I, I don't think that's possible. If you read the stories in the Gospels about the disciples, they had doubts. They had questions. There were so many times that they did not understand what Jesus was doing, who Jesus was, what Jesus was saying. There were so many times that they didn't understand. And it's in those times that we find that when we work through our doubts, our fears, our anxieties, when we work through that time of not knowing, that it so often brings us to a time of greater belief. And then we find that what Jesus said at the end of this passage to be true. Blessed are those who have not seen but yet believe. So brothers and sisters, it is not a problem to have questions, to ask the hard questions, to doubt, to wonder, to think, is this what I think it is? Because sometimes for us to grow in our faith, to get from maybe where our faith has plateaued, we have to go through those times so that we can grow in our faith. So that our faith can become stronger. So that we can know. And it's fascinating to me because in this, in this passage, it's almost as if Jesus takes Robert Ripley's line when he's talking to Thomas and he says, Look, here I am. Believe it or not, here I am. And Thomas... Thomas, who was not afraid. Thomas, who was willing to ask questions, probably that nobody else would ask. Lord, we don't know what you're talking about. Where are you going? We don't know where you're going. How do we know how, do, how we're going to know how to get there? Thomas sees Jesus and says, My Lord and my God. He makes an exclamation of faith that rings through the centuries down to us. My my Lord and my God. So may we never think that our doubts, our questions, the times that, that we struggle, sometimes, brothers and sisters, what those are for us are times of intense growth. It's times of God helping us get to a place of deeper faith. And that's exactly what happened to Thomas you all know that my favorite writer probably of all time, my favorite Christian writer is C.S. Lewis. And I found a quote from C.S. Lewis that, that I really couldn't hardly believe it when I read it. And C.S. Lewis said, you can't know, you can only believe or not. You can't know, you can only believe or not. And it is faith, brothers and sisters, that helps us when we can't know, but we want to believe. And what I will say to you this morning is I believe that Thomas wanted to believe. He wanted to know. He wanted to see Jesus, and he was able to do so. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that when we seek Jesus, just as he said, Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Sometimes it is those periods when we wonder, when we shake our heads, when we ask the questions like, Thomas, Lord, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know what this means. It is those times that help us get to the faith, the faith just like Thomas had, the faith to say, my Lord and my God. Believe it or not. Just remember that Jesus promised even more blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. And the good news today, brothers and sisters, that's us. 
that's us. Blessed are we who have not seen, yet believed.